Happy Good Friday, as it is called. I just was going to say Happy Friday. Uh, I don't believe in the whole Good Friday thing, and even in Christian theology, I don't think there's, you know, any reason to call it good if you're murdering somebody um, due to a uh, lack of judicial fairness in a mock trial. Um, whether or not that story was made up, which I think it was. But anyway, we're on the mind control page, cult mind control page in the kingdoms of Satan, Yahweh, and Mormonism on Mormon Truth Video's Gospel Topic Sub. But today's subject is going to focus uh, on comments. Uh, I've got so many uh, really good thought-provoking and thoughtful comments, often uh, with lots of... Uh, um, literary, um, you know, documentation, stuff out of the scriptures, historical stuff. I, I want to just pay tribute to so many of our viewers, just a, a, a large variety of people that are contributing really good thought-provoking comments, not, not the kind of stuff you see on, uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> your average Facebook kind of a page or uh, on, uh, say, something, uh, you know, like uh, Three Mormons or something like that. Like, I love your goldfish. I mean, you guys do some serious thinking. We got a great, a, a great viewership here. And so, um, first thing I wanted to do, though, is get into, uh, I, I wanted to share a little bit about my trip to Salt Lake City during General Conference, and a thought I uh, have regarding that, because as you all know, I try really hard to uh, share what I believe is true in order to liberate people from what I consider to be very uh, damaging effects of Mormonism. So I want to differentiate. Maybe I'll call this video um, anti-Mormonism means loving mind-controlled Latter-day Saints. Um, occasionally I see some unkind remarks towards LDS people in general. Uh, <laughs> Jim Caponzi is especially good at that. Uh, he's a promoter of Catholicism and sounds very hateful towards Latter-day Saints in general or Mormons. And Jim, you know, I appreciate some of your comments. However, I've tried to help you differentiate between your average mind-controlled Latter-day Saint and those who are involved in the pedophilia rings, the networks, um, and in the generational satanic families in the LDS church, not all of whom are in high positions of leadership. And I acknowledge that your average Joe <clears throat> can can be in, involved in this satanic ritual abuse and uh, human sacrifice and all those sorts of things that uh, LDS uh, um, presiding bishopric member Glenn Pace brought out in the Glenn Pace memo, which I tend to think was possibly intentionally leaked, because it's so, uh, it, you know, it's so rampant, uh, and, and so, you know, getting more and more, it was getting more and more, uh, you know, well known that the, the 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 human sacrifice and and this this you know pedophile activity in these networks, even back when this was uh, leaked, uh, was rampant within the church, and Glenn Pace was saying. Oh, well, he believes that there is a secret combination within the church, as discussed in the Book of Mormon and in the Book of Moses, but wanted to get the heat off of uh, the brethren who cover this stuff up. Uh, institutionally, the church covers up all sorts of uh, uh, sexual uh you know, uh, abuse uh, and uh, molestation, just as the Catholic Church does, because... They're a lot more related than people think. So um, let's differentiate because there are so many really good people who are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I have personal friends that are really good, really great people. And how can they be my friends and still be, you know, members? Well, they're, you know, some of them haven't, I haven't had the opportunity to educate and uh, I was, uh, you know, I was pretty non-functional for about four years after I had a nervous breakdown. 
I'm just learning now about, you know, the damage that occurs to the vagus nerve when the sympathetic nervous system is overstressed constantly. And as several people that are close to me have said, they don't know anyone else that's experienced more trauma or survived more trauma than me personally. I can't say that that's probably true of everyone in the world, but I have gone through a hell of a lot of uh, psychological trauma and Mormonism has a lot to do with it. So um, when I went to Salt Lake, I, uh, I thought, you know, let's see what's going on here around the conference center, around Temple Square, who is, who is outing Russell Nelson and his Luciferian cohorts as what they are. And what did I see? I saw almost no one. I saw a few Christians making their play of comparing Mormonism to what they believe to be true out of the Bible and showing some contradictions there. I got a photograph of them in here somewhere, I think. In my gallery here, I saw a, a couple of um, people uh, promoting the gay, lesbian um, uh, cause, uh, the cause for sympathy uh, for people that are not identifying with the uh, with you know with the equipment they were born with, and um, tired of being treated like shit. And although I am kind of very uh, averse to uh, anything that's in that in that venue, uh, I, 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 I find it to be um, repulsive. Um, I know that there are a lot of good human beings who just happen to be um, in the wrong body. If you believe in uh, a spirit getting put in the wrong body, um, of course, Spencer Kimball said that's impossible. That's blasphemy. God couldn't do that. So they just decided to use these uh, uh, <laughs> these torture therapies at BYU to condition people to not want to be gay. And that's pretty horrific. But it, it, it is a very valid point that Spencer Kimball was bringing up because, you know, if you prepared through the eternities to come to this life, to take your role to the to to the highest uh, potential you could have as a son or daughter of God, why the hell would he stick you, you know, in 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 a in in the body of a, screw screw up the order there, you know, in uh, the fulfillment section, uh, <laughs> sending you into a, somebody into a, a girl's body if you're a guy or vice versa. So anyway, there was a there was a transgendering youth there, and then there was a girl who was. Um, I think she was bisexual, and and they were on the corner there of the uh, at, at the conference center, and I I stopped. They were talking to a couple of guys, and um, I I waited, and then I guess they decided that they wanted to uh, to to head out right then, so I didn't get the chance to talk with them, to get their perspective because you know they're people too, and a lot of these kids have gone grown up feeling horrible about themselves, and you know try to pray the gay away and that sort of a thing and it uh, hasn't worked out too well because uh, that guy that's supposed to answer your prayers wasn't any better with them uh, than he was with me when I needed help to save my family um, apparently uh, God's on vacation a lot or well if you if you look at the fact that we got like 340,000 births a day on in, in this world it, it must be quite a job to keep up to keep up the pace of, of, of providing spirit children to keep up uh, uh, 340,000 babies a day so the gestation periods out uh, obviously got to be pretty pretty short and probably painless because we know that it was multiplied uh, the pain was multiplied of bearing children um, I will multiply thy sorrow in conception, but uh, that's how you'll get salvation, girls. That's what's taught in, in Genesis, as Eve and all the daughters of Eve, as they are referred to in the temple, were cursed with this difficult um, time of childbearing compared to a lot of animals that can just uh, <clears throat> take care of their their uh, birth birthing process and, and have much more easily. So... Um, I continued on to Temple Square and met these uh, 
Well, I, I, I sat down to see if uh, anybody had talked to me, any, any of these missionaries, and they didn't. But the, uh, that's when I went out and, and, and took that detour, which I mentioned. Then I, I walked back in, and these couple of sister missionaries, you know, were walking the opposite way of me. And they walked towards me, and they were friendly and said hello. And I kind of slowed down and uh, just said, hey, hi. And so, of course, they took the opportunity to begin uh, chatting with me. And so, you know, they were just really, really nice, sincere girls. And uh, another perfect example of why you just can't, you, you, you can't, you can't, you know, just hate people because they're Mormon or think they're stupid. They were not stupid. I see these comments sometimes and go, how could you be so stupid, Mormons? Well, you have to understand the LDS Sunday School Priesthood Relief Society, you know, curriculum is geared to obfuscate the issues that are brought up so much in the uh, ex-Mormon, anti-Mormonism community um, where where things are discussed that, that are not reconcilable to the truth and authority claims of the church. These people just don't know, and cult mind control is the culprit in this case most of the time because the conditioning it's not just the information control that's big it's not just the behavioral control it's it's actually programming that that causes us to reject even the possibility of listening to uh, anything that could diminish our faith because we are programmed in the LDS church to believe that that's all of the devil so we just need to disconnect from the truth <laughs> disconnect from anti-mormonism and reconnect with the holy spirit if i'm quoting uh, elder christian christofferson correctly so that's what's programmed into into these many of them into these good people and so i i was able to converse with these sister missionaries and uh, you know they asked we just we started having kind of a personal uh, discussion and in and they asked me some questions and i you know so we talked a little bit about our lives and, and you know they asked me about family life and things like that and what that did was that it allowed me to share in a very sincere uh venue with them uh my experiences in some things relating to the destruction of my family which um you know they had to notice that I was completely sincere in, and, and and in that process, uh, there are a number of things that would alert someone to uh, the fact that, well, the Lord isn't exactly consistent in keeping his word, his promises were no good to me, that sort of a thing. I, I shared the fact that I've fasted, you know, as long as 14 days with no food and I mean nothing but water I didn't I, I, I didn't pull a you know a Sam Young thing or you know and, and have electrolytes and all that good stuff I just had water for 14 days and it wasn't the only time I did this but 14 days was the longest I, I've done it by about nine days and 22 hours three to four to five days multiple times and I was seeking specific help and calling upon uh, heaven and praying for deliverance uh, from uh, a a demonic presence and the New Testament says uh, that Jesus saith this kind goeth out only through fasting and prayer when the apostles failed and I had been failed nine times I think by um, maybe more than that bishopric members bishop friends bishop stake presidency uh, high priest group leader and multiple sets of missionaries when I asked for uh, deliverance from uh, the influence and effects of uh, unfriendly uh, <clears throat> spirits we'll go with for now so um, and the promises that came to destroy my family, which were all fulfilled just as told to someone else, not me, by the way, and unsolicited. So I found that these promises were no good. Uh, I, I don't know. Would Jesus have kept his promise if I fasted 17 days, 18 days? You know, 
it, I mean, 14 days should have been sufficient, but it wasn't. I got no help, and I lost my family. Um, the Book of Mormon constantly tells us how we're blessed immediately, even when we keep the commandments of God, and and then of course you know we become super prosperous because it says right in there that if we keep the commandments, we will prosper in the land. Then it goes that the Lord doth immediately bless you. Then you're indebted to Him. All that you know argument you find in like Mosiah and stuff like that, and. You know how you're blessed for tithing and i paid more than tithing and my fast offerings and i fasted i mean i really fasted um i mean i was i was really good about keeping the sabbath and i saw these people that you know were doing very well financially and i worked hard and i'm not a stupid person and i'm a decent entrepreneur and you know the blessings just were not there the promises didn't come this is the whole thing of the nephite pro the nephite pride cycle it's, it comes in the book of mormon because it says god immediately blesses you if you keep the commandments you know and uh, i kept the sabbath day which is tied to you know prosperity and all that stuff and i'm not saying i never made any money but i really needed to make a lot more and the promises were lies in so many things and then as far as my marriage goes first time I had spiritual experiences guiding me uh, to the girl I married as a, chi a child, a teenager, at 19, I was 19, and she was a freaking nightmare from an occultist, uh, well her dad was an occultist, and she was queen of the Job's daughters, and she just was all screwed up, probably molested herself as a child, um, I have no doubt of that, his here, dad was a Freemason, high ranking Freemason. Not sure how high, but high enough that he was holding the guy's head in a picture he kept in his secret office, which multiple people have seen, when he foolishly left his keys out. So, um, yeah, definitely a bad guy. And uh, that was a nightmare for like 16 years. And then I had a spiritually guided, I mean, I was told where to go, what to say, what to do. And the response was exactly as I was, you know, it, it, it was it was so amazing uh, how I uh, wound up, uh, you know, it, with um, the the guidance and that and things that occurred uh, in meeting my wife after about two years of um, the first marriage being being uh, you know from the initial separation I would say. Um, from, from a marriage that was a nightmare that I was faithful in year after year. And so when I met this girl, um, I had uh, been already on maybe a, a, a date with one other gal I met at a Mormon dance, but I found out, you know, she told me her situation. She divorced her husband because he wasn't making enough money or something. Um, <laughs> he wasn't ambitious enough, whatever. And I know what it says in First Nephi, Third Nephi, chapter twelve. It's a direct copy of what's in Matthew chapter five out of the Sermon on the Mount, and it basically says, you know, if a woman uh, divorces or if a woman is divorced, and it really refers to it as a husband putting the wife away because a wife couldn't put the husband away, I guess back then. Then, uh, unless it was for adultery, then her any subsequent relationships would be adultery. Well, I was a faithful husband even to that horrible woman in the first, and I was a faithful husband with my second wife, but when I had a breakdown after some horrible things, just, just too much happened, and I was unable to function, she left. She later divorced me, even though we were, you know, she was... You know, she, she was, we, we, she didn't leave because we didn't get along. She left because it was a desperate situation, which I can't necessarily blame her for, but she just didn't come back. And she divorced me in order to take advantage of a loan program, I was told, to buy a house as a single woman. And later, apparently felt it was necessary to take the offer of some guy to be uh, her husband later of divorcing me in the temple which thing i didn't even know existed i was always told no there's no such thing as a temple divorce 
And yet I'd been a faithful husband and she'd pledged to stay with me in sickness and in health. That would include a nervous breakdown. Um, and we weren't fighting. We did get along very well. She was very, you know, hardworking, dedicated and, and good wife and mother. But she was in difficult circumstances. You have to write the prophet for this. You have to get the you have to get the approval of the prophet the president of the LDS church to have a temple divorce because you're breaking an eternal uh, covenant which which supposedly we can't break and we're breaking an eternal covenant and a husband had been faithful and I was super family guy uh, I was the most dedicated dad I think I've ever met. I'm sure there are other great dads, but I, you know, really prioritized my family. And yet the president of the church granted that us being sealed for time and all eternity would be destroyed. When in order to allow a marriage, a new marriage that would, according to the New Testament and the Book of Mormon copied directly out of the New Testament word for word there on that subject be considered adultery. So anyway, I shared this story with the girls um, which uh, should get some questioning going. You know, it should get someone to, to notice, hey, you know, there's there's something rotten in Denmark um, you know something something's wrong here why would a prophet of god grant this temple divorce when it violates um lds scripture and doctrine so um that and you know like i said i i related some of the other things i tested the promises of the lord as we call them in the scriptures and found them to be worthless as well as the priesthood i'm not saying priesthood blessings never cause healings i've experienced that and i've done it but i did it before i was a member of the church as well i gave up healing people as a child as a you know teenager after i got the priesthood and felt funny about where the power came from I, I was concerned. I didn't want to be, even though I was doing good things, I told my family I could no longer be called upon for, you know, doing healings, um, even if they had a headache, because I didn't know where this power came from. And I didn't want to risk it being from a source that was not right. And besides that, we were taught in the LDS Church that everything has to be part of this authority chain from the LDS Church. So, bottom line, that and another, and so, I, so I, you have to go out of your way sometimes. I didn't really have to go out of my way. I just had to open up and share some things with these girls that allowed them uh, to to see that you know um, things were not the way they'd been taught. One of them was a new convert of two years, and uh, she shared with me how she went from. Uh, being a born-again Christian to becoming Mormon, basically because Christianity provides no real reason for existing. Um, you either are going to play a harp or roast in hell. Um, it's one or the other, and I me, mean, I don't think I'd really like to play a harp and either. So, with Mormonism, you've got the premortal existence. You've got the all. You know, you're becoming a god or goddess. There's a there, there, there's there's a purpose. The plan of salvation is. You know something that gives some logical reason for our existence and hope so a step-by-step -step, you know masonic <laughs> degree by degree style progression it makes some sense so she but but she was unaware probably of a lot of things and i shared with them the fact that i thought that I knew that their leaders were liars and that they were evil men and that they did things that were so bad that there'd be no way that they'd probably be able to believe it because of the fact they'd been conditioned to think these guys were super good guys. Uh, they got a little uncomfortable <laughs> at that point, but they were still very polite because uh, we had established uh, some rapport and, um, you know, had good feelings towards one another they knew that i was sincere i knew that they were good sincere people so i want to make sure we treat people 
you know, kindly that are mind control victims of the LDS church, not just assume they're stupid or bad or approve of uh, things that, you know, sound or, and or are wrong uh, because the way they've been programmed is, is very specific and the temple is very involved with that and there is constant programming used at church. There is plenty of NLP used by the brethren. There are hypnotic influences even and especially in preparing the mind to receive programming through uh, the music, lulling people into an alpha wave state and then going ahead and using hypnotic repetition uh, and it could be something like follow the prophet follow the prophet follow the prophet don't go astray he knows the way you know and uh, in the next verse and so forth so those things get drummed into these kids sunday after sunday after sunday and it creates a mindset that makes it very difficult to even uh to, to, to even examine the materials that have awakened many of us. So anyway, that's what I want to say. And I, and I met with another gal, uh, a very uh, intelligent and kind, good person uh, that I was able to speak with, uh, just, you know, visiting. And then somehow, you know, life just gets into what life's been all about. And life for her is Mormonism. Life for me was Mormonism. And... Uh, it's basically immoral and impossible for me to avoid uh, sharing what I've learned about how, how 180 degrees different reality is from what we are programmed in to believe regarding the LDS church, its true purpose, and the character of its highest leaders in the generational satanic families and those who decide to go ahead and align themselves with them just as people have to align in certain covenants that they make in in you know in Hollywood to get anywhere or in the music industry um, etc my belief is you really don't get that high anywhere without um, be joining the network so, are we going to get to any of these comments? I might have to read this mind control thing a little bit later because we're not going to get to any comments very soon if I don't. So let's do that. Yeah. Oh, so anyway, that second uh, thing I was mentioning, that, that, that visit with this uh, gal that uh, really got into uh, several subjects uh, in Mormonism, which I was able to document that just are not consistent with what she's been told by the brethren. God, what is this stupid thing? Come on, get the thing out of here. Get out of here. Mmm. All right, got rid of that thing for not being connected to the network up there. Um, you know, there could be all kinds of outages here if a tornado hits. So um, let's go to the comments, and I'll hit this uh, mind control page later. Okay, I want to do some ones that are, you know very recent but i've been wanting to uh say something uh regarding this comment here that which is uh i don't know several weeks ago uh i hope i pronounced your name right is it uh adrian or a adriana simmons so um or adrian yeah I, i'm just not quite sure so um and this this comment evidently got deleted so i i tried to find it in gmail and couldn't find it it says if possible could you do a review of the travis wayne good cell video uh and i know it was about uh basically the conspiracy of brigham young um to not only murder samuel smith you know but to murder um hiram and joseph smith and um 
I, so I went to look for that and I actually didn't find his video on that, although I have watched other uh, material on that showing that the ballistics just don't at all match what we were told in the story. There's no way, you know, that those bullets came and did what they did, uh, you know, from the, the angles that we are, that we are told. And, and it, it does sound to me very much like, uh, we have not been told the truth about that and that uh, the the likelihood of uh, Brigham having um, Dr. Richards and John Taylor uh, kill the Smith brothers was um, was rather plausible actually uh, especially considering you know uh, what he did afterwards and um, then his connections uh, you know, through Freemasonry and uh, occult uh, practitioners and financial uh, connections uh, to uh, Kuhn and Loeb. Other that I, I actually I was more familiar with it with the church's uh, you know dealings and other things, but uh, I I've read uh, you know a number of uh, references to the, him being backed by Kuhn and Loeb, uh, as well as Heber J. Grant getting backed by Union Bank of New York. So uh, we know who those banks are connected with, um, you know, J.P. Morgan and Rockefeller interests. So, um, yeah, that was very plausible. But the, the video that I did find that it was about that same time, you really talked about how Brigham, you know, seized power uh, after that. And, uh, you know, how the church uh, structure has even changed. And, and if we, we look, you know, the traveling 12, uh, and you know the powers of the High Council, the powers of the Traveling High Council, which became the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Um, uh, there were various things that Travis Wayne Goodsell uh, examined there, and that he did. I thought he did a, a nice job of uh, showing how the Church basically uh, changed in its structure. Um, as we know, um, you know there there was no such thing as priesthood until like it was at least 1834, and then they had to uh, get rid of the Book of Commandments and you know rewrite some things and create the Doctrine and Covenants, so the story would be compatible with this. Uh, this new invention of um, of uh, John the Baptist uh, giving the Aaronic priesthood to um, Oliver Cowdery and Joseph Smith in 1829, and then Peter, James, and John giving them the Melchizedek priesthood after this narrative occurred uh, it, it, to Joseph Smith that, that somehow that he wanted to justify his uh, his authority uh, in, in this thing. So they pulled that thing off and. Uh, there were a lot of changes that, that that took place, just like when he invented that uh, first vision story, story really late in the game there and published it in 1842, and, and Noah didn't, had heard anything about it. It was all about this 1823 first vision uh, with the angel Nephi, who uh, you know guided him to the golden plate, supposedly. Which, of course, Orson Pratt changed to call, changed changed it to be uh, Moroni instead of Nephi, because we can see that where Joseph Smith published this with the help of Oliver Cowdery in the Times and Seasons, 1835, he was referring to the messenger uh, Nephi, not to Moroni, and it's also, I think, in the uh, Messenger and Advocate and elsewhere. So, um, constantly rewriting history and giving us a false narrative of how things have occurred is is uh, yeah it's something that that's what the LDS church has been based on it's been based on lies from the beginning uh, the seerstone business you know that they were you know doing in front of the Whitmer family to pretend that Joseph Smith was seeing this on a seerstone and channeling it well, if he was, he was channeling a lot of wrong information. He was channeling stuff directly out of the King James, uh, you know, 1769 version of the Bible right from his house that included things he'd later correct in the uh, in, in the inspired version of the Bible as having been corrupted by the great and abominable Catholic Church. Um I'm taking the liberty of saying Catholic since Brigham Young did, and it's well well described in the uh, first Nephi chapter 13. So, uh, 
Yeah, this was just a charade to pretend that Joseph Smith was coming up with this stuff. I'm sure it was already written uh, by family members and others. Um, and uh, recited as when this charade with the uh, with the magic stone business, which I didn't seem to think he was very successful with in his treasure seeking ventures either. So um, it happened to be something that would be plausible to many people in that day of their early audience, but then they decided this doesn't look so good that so they. They, they hid that thing in the first presidency vault for an awful long time and then just recently got, you know, to the point where they had to admit that uh, it existed. And so now we're supposed to believe that Joseph Smith actually channeled the Book of Mormon with all of its ridiculous plagiarism straight out of the Bible and stuff out of, uh, you know, view of the Hebrews and <clears throat> late war between Great Britain and the United States. Uh, just channeled that all wrong you know channeled all kinds of stuff wrong channeled jesus uh contradicting himself ether chapter three telling the telling the brother of jared he's the first guy to ever see him because he's the first guy to have adequate faith when we've got him doing the same exact things that you got enoch doing 1100 years or so earlier moving mountains moving rivers and talking face to face with the lord as one man speaketh with another and you know, the guy just can't get out of his own way with all these mistakes. But I don't think Joseph Smith wrote the Book of Mormon, but he was responsible for the Doctrine and Covenants and the retranslation or his insertions and changes in the Bible, which show him up <laughs> and show up the Book of Mormon, at least, which he, you know, claimed to be the author of in its 1830 version, author and proprietor of. So he's taken responsibility, at least, even if uh, we're not to believe that he actually wrote it, which, like I said, I don't believe is the case. Uh, so Travis Wayne Goodsell, yeah, I think he's got some good information. His presentation can be, uh, I have heard people say that they didn't, I don't want to watch a dude eating like tater tots at two o'clock in the morning. Okay. There's a couple of things he could probably do to uh, improve it, but he, he is an intelligent guy and uh, he, he has a uh, you know, fair amount of knowledge in uh, some aspects of church history. So I admire what he's doing and he's gone through a hell of a lot. Um, he lost his family too. So I think he's a very sincere individual and, uh, and uh, very well read. He's very well educated in uh, these, you know, a lot of these matters. So there's your response on that, Adrian. All right, coming back closer to the present, and I sorry to not read stuff from in between. We got so many, so many different people coming, and we got people that are, you know, talking trash to me or some that are, I think are shills and others that are just believing Mormons and I welcome that. I welcome the opportunity to talk to these people um, because it's um, it's a good opportunity to show the techniques that are used to obfuscate purposely by the shills and it's a good chance to engage in conversation with uh, sincere believing Mormons like I did with the uh, those different sisters that I just mentioned while I was in Salt Lake and people can be very very sincere and believe what you know they believe you know we had a guy in here Johnny Phoenix who show who, he's back there a little bit but I'll just mention he shared some things uh, that I would have shared and that I believed you know uh, were uh, evidences of, uh, you know, the restored gospel of Jesus Christ, as Quack, who likes to call it, uh, discussing, uh, oh, I, I, yeah, I guess I talked about that a couple of weeks ago, about, you know, the, the Isaiah uh, chapter 2. But then again, that's about, you know, Jerusalem. It's not about Independence, Missouri, and we already went over that, so I'm not going to mention that. But he's a guy that seems real sincere. He told me he's a 22-year-old returned missionary. And I think he just believes uh, what he's saying and is probably a sincere person. I like to give people the benefit of the doubt. You know, I've been having a lot of really great comments by... Um, Rice Pande. So, um, there's so many of them, though. I don't know which one to use. And, 
I really appreciate the um, should I just click on that one here all right Dodger game I mentioned to uh, she means Jesse that you two should do a collab video I think she's worried because you're an atheist maybe I'm wrong but I've never seen you be disrespectful or inappropriately attack people I think the two of you could collab on the contradictions of Mormonism obviously you don't need her to do that but my but myself I think it's interesting when two minds get together so my response was yeah imagine me and Jesse and I actually just saw a comment from her and mentioned doing a collab how about that right before I saw your comment I sure appreciate all your support here in the comment section you make a lot of great Tom and Jerry okay so a commentary that's a it's a text voice to text error also I do not consider myself an atheist I'm well acquainted with the magic world before and during Mormonism I grew up without any church really other than going to my friend's dad's church his dad was the pastor of a Methodist church which I attended intermittently that would not allow I would not allow him to baptize me because I did not feel he held any authority and he did not impress me as an individual seeking, uh, oh gosh, I hate to say everything that sounds Masonic, but light and truth. For a while, I was a child healer until I joined the church. I mentioned that earlier. Um, my spiritual experiences go way beyond just feelings, but involve physical world being affected as well as other people being witnesses of metaphysical interventions from an unseen power including while preaching mormonism sometimes so um that wasn't one of the comments where she is making a lot of these thought-provoking um points i suppose it's better if i prepare once in a while sometimes but i just don't manage to do that on these comment response ones um okay Let's see what we got here Rice says here, if we claim it, meaning the Book of Mormon uh, drama, story, if we claim it took place in Mesoamerica, correct me if I'm wrong, Dodger Game, but didn't Joseph Smith say the Hill Cumora and in, in New York was the Book of Mormon sites? Did the church just shift to these other possible other sites because they couldn't find you know the million bodies from that great battle or any other evidence in North America anywhere so a million body would be uh, the Jaredites and then a couple hundred thousands of just Nephites just Nephite men uh, would have been uh, the Kumura battle they called the same hill Rama I think in the Jaredite fairy tale so I said that's pretty much the way I believe it to be and yes Joseph Smith said that Zarahemla was just across the river from Nauvoo and then he found Zelf the white Lamanite somewhere there in North America and they did of course uh, watch him resurrect or something right in front of their eyes so Joseph Smith definitely was not advocating for the Book of Mormon to be at least confined to Mesoamerica um, anything I've ever seen so we're so we're supposed just to believe that Moroni took a casual 2,500 mile walk up the coast from Guatemala City or so um, just so he could deposit the plates conveniently uh, near Joseph Smith's backyard for future reference and we thought it was rough for Joseph Smith to carry 200 pound gold plates from the mountain just down to the wagon or the house he should have tried walking 2,500 miles with 200-pound plates. All right. Yeah, so um, <sighs> Quacku trying to place, well, it's not that it's Quacku. It's LDS apologists uh, try to place um, the Book of Mormon in Mesoamerica uh, and, uh, because... I think it's got to be, you know, why would they do that? Well, you know, sure, you could say, you know, they, they started south and went north, but um, if we can't find these artifacts, 
nothing to support it, a battle, uh, a series of battles that had to leave evidence of these wars. Um, not to mention the steel swords, steel, you know, breastplates. And we just don't have anything that should be just, you know, littering the hill Cumorah, which the church owns. They would have leveled it and showed us evidence by now if they believed it was there. Not to mention the treasure cave that Joseph Smith said was there and that Oliver Cowdery and Brigham Young talked about, wagon loads of plates of gold and all this kind of ridiculous Rumpelstiltskin style baloney. Uh, it's just crazy folklore. You know, it sounds, you know, like Paul Bunyan or Rump, you know, Rip Van Winkle, the, the kind of stories that the Latter day Saints believed from these guys are amazing. Uh, but then again, they were believing he was getting it off, off, off a rock for a while till they hid that. And then, then, then they've showed us these, you know, pictures in the end sign of Joseph Smith just pondering these gold plates maybe with some glasses on oh that is that supposed to be the Urim and Thummim never said in the in, in the in the Book of Mormon that that you know the that the spectacles were Urim and Thummim that's just then their attempt Cowdery's attempt I guess to to link something to something that, where people have already been brainwashed enough to believe is credible in the Bible and when you look at Urim and Thummim there even if Urim and Thummim mean light and truth or something like that Freemasonry again right um, they were two out of like a dozen or so stones on the breastplate of Aaron in the story that he had to wear this magic breastplate when he entered the tabernacle it had absolutely zero to do with looking at these stones to to interpret ancient languages into a new language or anything of the sort so how anybody can 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 try to act like oh see it's biblical look they had it they had the urim and thummim there the book of mormon doesn't say urim and thummim people okay you know, it talks about it, like a seer stone. It talks about interpreters in, in the book of Ether. Uh, the seer stone business, I think, is in Mosiah. The, you look at the stone and it would bring, you know, things to light, that wicked deeds of, you know, the secret combinations and stuff. I mean, seriously. So what we keep finding is, is, is that these people trying to do this apologetic stuff for the church, they, they're... They try to find some little loophole. You got to find some little loophole in like, you know, about a hundred different things that obviously are not consistent with science, anthropology, or a God that keeps his word or can remember what he said even in the, even in the last verse. Section 76 of the Doctrine and Covenants. I, I just made a comment to Johnny Phoenix on another site there, and I think on one of Quackus or something, where I was. Uh, he, he's talking about Moses uh, in the Book of Moses, where Joseph Smith added to the Bible there and said, uh, Oh, worlds without number have I created, and that sort of thing. Well, he says it also in Doctrine and Covenants section 76. And right before right before that, he's saying, talking about him, you know, Jesus being the only begotten. He doesn't say Jesus, but he's referring to the Son. And then he says he's the only begotten. And then he says, by him, through him, and of him, the worlds are, were, and are, and were created. And the inhabitants thereof, in other words, all these extraterrestrial aliens or whatever, the inhabitants of these other worlds are begotten sons and daughters unto God. The previous verse, he just, you know, he's, he's telling us that Jesus is the only begotten. Now everybody's begotten. Then why say begotten? You know, if you want to say spirit children, then then Jesus isn't the only spirit child. So if you use it in the same context, you've got a problem either way you go. Um, any, yeah, or uh, Second Nephi, Second Nephi chapter five, verses fifteen and sixteen, talking about all the precious, you know, metals and stuff they've got to build the temple of Solomon. The next verse, they said they built it like the temple of Solomon, verse sixteen, except for they didn't have anything, any precious stuff to put in it. So, you know, it was a little more basic looking, because they left it in the last verse. On top of that, what what does it take? Yeah, uh, uh, what they have like a hundred and eighty thousand. You know, dudes working on it for seven years to create the Temple of Solomon, and now you got like, you know, half of Lehi's party doing it. 
yeah. Um, and of course, uh, we never found it. Oh, do, do, do we want to call it like the Temple of the Moon, the Temple of Solomon? Oh, it, was that built by like 25 people? Really? Um, all we have to do is really fact check these things just to see that this it's, is just un, unbelievable that people would make these claims that the Book of Mormon could be true. I've got this guy t telling me, uh, where is this one? Was it Luke started off with his business? about <laughs> mm. okay here we got Luke Steele whom I think is a shill because I don't think he could possibly honestly believe all this stuff that he says so he says Kristen Maya civilization existed from about 600 BC to about 400 AD in other words, exactly matching the Nephite uh, story, right? As add, as though that matching the Nephites could be a coincidence, I've known that since the 1980s when I took a little more, took a more work to when it took more work to find out than it does now. Well, so I just Googled that, and there's this whole litany of dates, you know, of things div working up to their ancestors getting to maybe having a civilization, which it said basically was really happening uh, between 6 and 900, you know, A.D. after this. So now he comes back and says, well, they could have been Lamanites. Gee, why don't they have any Lamanite DNA, Luke? And, uh, <laughs> God... Yeah, so this is just an out and out, you know, lie. The, 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 there's nothing anywhere that I've ever found that will tell you the Mayans were all about 600 BC to 400 AD. That was just complete dishonesty. So fact check, people. Fact check. Just right here, I googled Maya, you know, timeline. I got Maya cultural periods and so forth. And so we've got the Maya culture flourished from the late classic period from 600 to 800 AD. The Maya classic collapse was between 8 and 900 AD. Actually, I've read 900 to 1000 somewhere else, but it's, it's nothing like it was 600 BC to 400 AD. You know? I mean, none of these, uh, none, of, none of these, uh, I mean, I was looking at that kind of stuff. None of these Indian groups that we call Native Americans, whatever, you know, you want to uh, say, correspond well to the Book of Mormon. You know, you try to say, we're the Olmecs, the Jaredites. Well, they don't exactly correspond, but it's closer than you get with Mayans and Aztecs. Um, but just to just to to make a statement like that was totally dishonest because it's not supported at all. He just decided that... Um, you know, maybe nobody would check that out and uh, had to bust him. Sorry, Luke. And so now he's just going to change and go to his next thing and say, well, what about the Olmecs, you know? Um, now here he is. Yeah, Tapir looks a little like a donkey. Seriously? Not that that is what the Book of Mormon is referring to as a donkey. Since horses and donkeys evolved in America, it's not beyond possibility that that is exactly what the Book of Mormon writers were referring to. Really? A tapir? Okay, I showed a tapir in that recent video. It's ridiculous. It, it looks like a capybara. It looks like a wild pig or something, a little bit. It doesn't look anything like a donkey. And... No, whatever. Okay, you know what? I'm going to continue with this one. Okay, um... Since horses and donkeys... Have, okay, he goes on. Describe the size of an... Okay. It's not beyond possibility that's exactly what the Book of Mormon's writers were referring to. You make issue with geographic reference without realizing the perspective of the described size of, of 
the areas is the Nephites being able to walk from the sea east to the sea west in a day and a half. Sorry, I have read that, and I don't even think you can do that by the Panama Canal. Uh, there were uh, invaders that did it in a couple, two and a half days, going from the Caribbean side, Spaniards, to um, you know, to the toward the west, cutting their way through the jungle, and it took them longer than that. However. Let's continue what he says. So we are not looking at an area of thousands of miles across, but at least, but at best, dozens to a few hundred. Honestly, Dodger, appropriate descriptor for you. The fact that you are trying to defend Jessica's shoddy scholarship with your own rationalizations instead of solid scholarship is embarrassing. Yeah, right. Well, the, the Book of Mormon is not scholarship. It's just a hoax. And we have plenty of references of large areas of North America being inhabited by the Lamanites, according to First Nephi chapter 13, for one. There are many references about the land southward and the land northward. We find Helaman chapter 3 I was talking about the other day showing that they had expanded upon all the face of the land from the sea north to the sea south to the sea east to the sea west covering the land and having to go great shipping great distances from the land southward to the land northward because the land northward where the jaredites had lived which is also referenced elsewhere in the book of mormon had been wiped out for trees they, they guess they cut down all the trees or something right and then they had this big this, you know, this big uh, civil war. So, um, and, the, and then the American Indians were going to be wiped out uh, or, or, or scattered and smitten by the Gentiles arriving because they didn't follow Jesus Christ anymore that they'd obviously never heard of. Um, so there's plenty of references to North America, and it's talking about the land where the Jaredites were too, um, as well as the people of Limhi. So, um, no. Sorry, Luke, it wasn't confined to some little tiny area in Mesoamerica or down near Panama or the, some narrow neck in Guatemala. No, they're talking, they're trying to make it sound like it's all North and South America because that's what they said. They said that the Lamanites spread over all the land and became the primary answers, ancestors of the American Indians, and that's because that's what the angel told Joseph Smith when the angel lied to him about that and got proven as a liar by the DNA results. So now they say that they disappeared into a pre-existing population, which the Book of Mormon says does not exist. So Luke now is telling me, why do I care what uh, Jeffrey Holland had to say? And now he's calling it opinions. Typical apologetic BS trying to excuse what church leaders say, okay, in something like the end sign. All right, here's, here he goes. What, Dodger game, what does Jeffrey R. Holland's opinions from 1976 have to do with this topic? Again, your ignorance of current scholarship is astounding. Your whole argument is based on false assumptions. If you want to be taken seriously by those you're trying to convince, do you really think regurgitating decades-old false arguments based on false assumptions is the way to do it? My estimation of your intelligence goes down day by day. You really should talk about something you know something about if the topic exists, if the topic exists, since you obviously don't know anything about this topic. Should I give Luke a heart? Let's give him a heart. Yeah. He obviously needs some help. So, um, 1976, Jeffrey Holland giving his opinions, and they're decades old. Sorry, but Jeffrey Holland was head of BYU, which is supposed to be all about scholarship. Luke? And these weren't his opinions. What he was doing was was putting his stamp of approval on what LDS scripture already said, which is that the flood of Noah, which history doesn't bear out, wiping out the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Chinese, the Sumerians, or the American Indians, since we still have American Indians who weren't washed away, 
But what Jeffrey says is that the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible, which affirms that this all happened, that Noah's flood wiped everybody out, wiped out everyone in America as well as everywhere else except for those eight people that landed in the Middle East, you know, around Turkey, Mount Ararat, supposedly, according to that myth. And that's why there was no one in the Americas, and that's why the Jaredites had to put all those animals into the barges to carry them there. I don't know who carried some to Australia after the flood. Maybe the kangaroos were super holy and hopped on water. You know? I mean, trying to figure out how the world would be repopulated after a flood wiping out everything, every mammal, every living creature except fish or maybe whales and dolphins in the ocean and then repopulating a world that was not on a single continent is ridiculous. So, Jeffrey tells us that Pangaea was broken up after the flood, which is what it says in the Bible. And, and then he reiterated what it says in the book of Ether, that after the waters washed off the land, it became a holy land, a, a choice land above all others. And so there were no people here, according to the Book of Mormon and according to biblical folklore called the Flood of Noah, there wouldn't have been. So he simply reiterated and he's put his holy stamp of approval on that, which is already LDS scripture. And now the Gospel Topics essays are completely dishonest regarding the fact that the Book of Mormon states that they had the land promised to be kept from the knowledge of other nations, that they would inherit it unto themselves, which obviously doesn't work well with trying to say this large pre-existing population swallowed up the Lamanites. That's why we can't find their DNA. Luke, repent. Get honest, buddy. I, I know that you can't believe this stuff because it's just impossible if you look at the facts to continue with that idiotic narrative. Your contradictions are as bad as those of the brethren. All right, Rice is going to back me up. Luke Steele, what's your point? The anachronisms and the Jewish fairy tale of the Old Testament, along with the items I mentioned above and the blatant borrowing from the King James Bible, prove Joseph Smith a liar. Thanks. Dion, DJ Norman. I personally think your comments are cryptically fascinating. Well, let's read DJ Norman's comment. DJ Norman has very cryptic comments. Sounds like he may have been a victim of MK mind control, which also lends itself to photographic memory and a knowledge of the satanic inner workings of the brethren, not just in the LDS church, but all throughout the occult network. It's today's date backwards. Okay, I don't want to go through all these. Um, all right, so Dion says, DJ Norman, personally, I think your comments are cryptically fascinating. Absolutely nothing surprises me anymore. How the elite and their sick beliefs. How sad is that? So up here, DJ Dave Norman is he he's got all these correlations between uh, the deaths, the death dates, and the number of days. Uh, all this numerology connecting like H.W. Uh, Bush and Barbara Bush and all sorts of other uh, th things. I don't know where he comes up with all of these dates. Um, he's got to be like. 200 IQ to have all this information in his head and, and access it so quickly on all these things the way he does. But he, he we know that that in the occult, a lot of, uh, of these dates, you know, like 9-11 of course was done on, you know, we've got various things that occur on certain dates for certain reasons and some of them, you know, we can see through predictive programming. Ron Bryan says... Quaalude, Qaddafi, I, I mean Quacku, uh, 
is pretty typical of today's younger Mormon apologists. Most of the older ones have just given up trying. Sometimes I miss Obi-Wan Moroni and others with the fake names. So he agrees it's a cult or a, a cult. Yeah, basically he tried to poo-poo you know, the whole thing. Just, he, he mentioned both. Yeah, he said, yeah, so it's a cult. Everything's a cult. It's all, all, everybody's a cult. What's wrong with a cult? You know, basically. And then a cult. Well, sure. Well, we're all cults. Well, yeah, all religions do qualify as cults by the definition in the dictionary. He at least got that thing right. <clears throat> Although the, the 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 way that the term is used now tends to mean something that is super uh, high control organization like the LDS Church, Scientology, the Moonies, JWs, etc. But Kraku was attempting to normalize everything in Mormonism and then make it look like you're out on a limb if you. Uh, see it otherwise and have a problem with Luciferians leading the church and just doesn't talk about them being Luciferians. Just say, oh, they're Freemasons. Everybody's a Freemason. You know, look, George Washington was. Does that really change anything? Randall Lehman, Dodger game. Oh, geez, down the rabbit hole. Okay, that's all I was going to say. Dallas. Dallas is a believing Mormon. And, um, I don't know, he's been fairly polite lately. He'd probably be a nice enough guy in the high priest meeting. Let's see what he says. Dodger, interesting review. Your summary seems to be constantly wrong, but never in doubt. Wait a minute, you said that earlier. Are you copying this? Just hang on, and I will review some of your comments, like walking back and forth from the Red Sea. Go to the text and quote it exactly. Hey, you go to the text. And that's pretty much what I told him. Yeah, Book of Mormon, First Nephi, they walk to the Red Sea in three days from Jerusalem. Not possible. Maybe if they had mopeds, huh? Sorry. <clears throat> Just randomly picking this like a, a lottery number. All right, Naomi Sessions. Yeah, well, maybe you are blocked, but I didn't do it. All right, who we got here? David, David who? Mocking the mockery doesn't make one righteous. The word Christian was created as a mockery by the pagan Greeks to minimize and make less of those that believed in the church of Yeshua. If you don't like members of Christ's church defending the gospel, don't attack it. What you're criticizing is one's belief and is similar to mockery of the pagans and Jews with the followers of Christ. The Christians in the Bible didn't angrily attack those with different beliefs. They were pacifists. Put down the sword of contention and take up the cross and seek peace, unity, and love with all men. Love with all men. I think Paul condemned that. Um, mocking the mockery. Did I mock him? It's possible. Did he deserve it? Yes. He, she, I don't know. I've, I've got comments here saying they think Quacku is a, is a transgender. Um, and, and naming specific characteristics, uh, facial features, and things like that. Well, you know, I'm not really an expert on that kind of a thing, but if that's the case, here I went and said I don't like guys being mean to girls and picking on them, and here maybe Quacko's just a girl in disguise, and I shouldn't be so mean. Sorry, Quacko. You're an honest... Well, he said he was an honest man, or he, she, whatever. Um, so I, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on uh, transgender... Uh, transgendering, which it is rumored that the elite are very into, so is Quacku, is Quacku an elitist uh, MK Ultra experiment child? I have no idea. The Christians in the Bible, Greeks to minimize those. Well, if it was invented by Greeks to minimize people, why is the term Christians in the Bible? 
I mean, excuse me, in the Book of Mormon. Then again, why are New Testament arguments in the Old Testament timeline in the Book of Mormon? Why are mistakes from the King James 1769 version that Joseph Smith's family had in the Book of Mormon? Why is there a quote out of uh, the... Um, <laughs> The, the late war with the, uh, between Great Britain and the United States referencing the 4th of July in the Book of Mormon. Well, because God is just incomprehensible, especially the Mormon God of Kwaku. I think I'm just going to end it there. We didn't get to as many comments as I went to, wanted to, but maybe I can upload this before some tornado takes out the phone lines. And uh, hope I didn't ramble too hard. I appreciate these comments, so many great comments, and uh, maybe I'm just too long-winded so I don't get to as many of them. Um, I could do like Quacko and just laugh at people, uh, but that isn't really my style, and he just mocks people that he doesn't have an answer for because the facts don't support his position. Happy Friday. All right, all right, all right. I did want to say something. Bubble Popper's back. She gave me a comment. I just can't hang up this thing without saying hello to Bubble Popper. So let's do that. Where are they? Oh, and so, yeah, Obi-Wan Juan, Juan Moroni. Hey, Ron Bryant, I have tried to contact uh, Jedi Mormon several times. I unfortunately think something must have happened to him. He's probably dead or had a stroke or something. I kind of like the old guy, actually. I think he may have been sincere. There's a possibility. Anyway, I felt sorry for him. So let's let's hit one more comment here. Let's see what Bubble Popper had to say. Come on, Bubble Popper. Come on. Where is it? Oh, anyway, DJ Norman was at, was talking about... Uh, I, I want to read this one, too, from Dave Norman. It says, They are going to announce the Salt Lake Temple closure today. Renovation. They have a chance to remodel the rooms to the left of the Celestial Room. I can only speak for the Medford Temple, but it is super easy to expand the Celestial Room to include the hidden room to the left. Also, I heard many, many bodies stacked like cord wood and buried in animal skins or behind a wall on the Salt Lake Temple layers of lime in between i guess they're going to keep getting away with it though cryptocurrency okay i don't know about the cryptocurrency get back here um he says from for four months on social media he's been talking about the murders in the medford temple uh when you go into the secret room going left from the veil and dave says don't go left from the veil always go right well yeah you're always supposed to go right out the veil but he did draw us a map and uh where is that maybe put it on my facebook uh page dodger davidson and a lot of times he gets blocked and stuff by google i guess even and and he gets blocked in facebook so dave seems to know something that uh somebody who controls the internet doesn't want us to know about something to do with the uh, human sacrifice that goes on in or under some of the LDS temples as it does in so many places controlled by these occultists okay bubble popper says he's justifying pentagrams okay bubble popper oh, please what am I doing here what is this? No, I'm not trying to do messages. Shit. Says, I know you believe Christianity is BS, and although I'm not where you are with that, I want you to know I adore you and appreciate the passion you put into your work. Other than a few belief differences, you and I are on the same page regarding the occult. I know that you don't believe in Jesus, parentheses Yeshua but what do you believe in I'm not messing with you I'm sincere in wanting to know by the way congrats okay so um let me just start with the whole Jesus Yeshua th thing right there yeah obviously no no believing devout royal lineage Jew would name their child Jesus a Greek name representing basically the 
the Gentiles there. They'd name their child a Hebrew name or at least an Aramaic name. I think Yeshua is Aramaic for Joshua and Jesus is Greek for it. So Yeshua and Yehoshua are possible names that someone could name their name, so their child. So, you know, so a lot of people are talking about Yeshua or Yehoshua and that kind of a thing. Uh, I don't believe that Jesus is an historical figure. I believe that Josephus is the only one of the many historians then that writes anything about him was a shill, uh, a, a, a basically a turncoat Jew who was, uh, you know, became chief propagandist for the Flavian family. And uh, Flavian family, I believe, uh, basically uh, commissioned the uh, writers who went under the pen names of uh, characters in the stories they created of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. At least Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John was a little later, but I mean, I think Mark came out first about 70 AD, and and they, and, and then they created uh, this allegorical uh, representation for Titus Flavius himself in the Jesus Christ character. So I believe that the that the Roman aristocracy did what every other you know, large, successful um, <sighs> empire has done. They created a religion to uh, create loyalty to its leaders. And that's what we always have had. Uh, the Egyptians certainly were deifying their kings, and here we have the offices, of, you know, and here, here we have Titus Flavius was being deified in the Jesus Christ uh, allegory, and um, it creates loyalty to the kingdom. It created a pacifist messiah, which is an oxymoron, since a messiah is a war hero, and the Jewish uh, culture, you know, had to do with... Uh, military defeat of all other nations basically if you read the uh, old testament certain didn't certainly didn't believe they should be enslaved to gentile romans so uh creating this messiah that goes completely against their culture uh and creates this uh you know this pacifism is uh is clearly benefiting the roman empire and of course these these texts that are selected by the uh you know, the, the, the Nicene Council, you know, 300 years later, are, uh, are you know, are, are called the Word of God. Why? Because these guys were so, uh, you know, they, they could, because they chose some writings of some Jews uh, and then some of the, uh, their own commissioned writers, you know, from the Flavian family, you know, um, you know, starting 70 AD to 110 AD, maybe, uh, that makes them infallible uh inspir inspired uh scripture seriously um you know and, and there are tons of other gospels what about the gnostic gospels you know what about the what about the gospel of mary magdalene the gospel of thomas the gospel of philip the gospel of um judas iscariot well <clears throat> they don't they don't favor what the uh Roman Church wanted uh, to to have uh, in in what they wanted to be called the Word of God, so they didn't make it. So yeah, that's what I think. Oh, here's that comment about um, about Quacko. Uh, this is Dion. She says he looks like he's transgendered. Tiny girl ears, oval-shaped feminine face, no male brow ridge, tiny sloped shoulders, rounded jawline. Put makeup and a dress on him, and he would pass for a female, no problem. Well, I don't think there's anything that could pass him off as a female that I'd ever wanted to have a date with, I'll tell you that. Um, yeah, he does kind of look effeminate, and uh, maybe that's why his buddy was looking at him with such uh, soulful eyes, I don't know. Okay, um... I'll get more in depth about maybe what I believe. Normally, it's the job of someone who's trying to unfreeze people from a false belief system, uh, from mind control, to fr unfreeze them and then to refreeze them into something else, a, a belief that gives hope. 
um, and normally locks him into another cult. <laughs> but I don't have <laughs> anything wonderful to say uh, about a new messiah and a new uh, you know, belief system that will give you eternal life if you just pay 10% of your income and uh, live the law of consecration and uh, follow your leaders as though they uh, walked on water. So I just uh, call it the way I see it and don't pretend to know everything about everything. I'm grateful for people's uh, participation here, whether they agree or not. If you can be decent to one another, that's appreciated honesty rather than uh, displaying um, apologetic technique is preferred but as you do give apologetic technique as Luke Steele was doing um, <clears throat> that's great because it allows me to demonstrate the deceptive tactics that are used just like we saw in Quacku's video there that's got so many of these comments this time I'm out have a great weekend everybody I'll probably try to do another video shortly uh, you know in, during this weekend if it's possible but um, take care and uh, please don't boycott Easter bunnies <laughs>